Hello everyone and welcome back to day 50 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, today we'll continue where we left off last time with logic design and other related topics. Um, first let me, um, I think I simplified the code a little bit from last time. Let me quickly, and, and I also have I guess a few corrections maybe or, or, or side notes on stuff I said that I want to clarify. Um, so uh, to very quickly review, um, I talked about, you know, how you can build up uh, Boolean logic expressions um, and, and construct modules, both top level modules that describe a single circuit, but also um, other modules that represent kind of reusable building blocks. Um, and like here we have XOR implemented directly in terms of, uh, of Boolean gates um, and so on. Um, and then after that, I talked about, uh, I kind of demonstrated with, uh, with actual code that takes a, uh, a truth table and turns it into a sum of products representation, which was uh, kind of a constructive proof that um, of, of sort of universality of uh, of the gate set of uh, and or and not, meaning any Boolean function, meaning any any function from n bits to one bit, can be represented uh, using and or and not. Um, and in fact, once you can represent a function with a one bit output, you can represent a function with any number of output bits because you can just build a, you can just build a sum of products representation for every output bit independently. Um, and so that basically shows you that a, a function from any number of bits to any number of bits can be represented with um, you know the classic boolean gate. So that's kind of a classical basic result, but um, we, here's basically a one-liner for how to implement that. So sum of products. Um, and I think I cleaned up a little bit of code just the way it's written after I noticed uh, when we were, uh, after we finished yesterday or the other day. Um, and then as an extension to that, um, this is a sort of qual quality of life thing or uh, kind of little trick. You can also take a black box Python function from any number of bits and turn it into a sum of products. And it goes through the table construction by first tabulating um, tabulating all possible return values of the function by iterating over you know, every combination of zero and one values for each of its arguments, calling it with that tuple of arguments and storing uh, those into a truth table and then, ta and then turning that truth table into a sum of products. Um, and one thing I, I, I don't think all of I think some of the examples were overwritten in place, but we showed that if you feed in certain functions, it finds a pretty good, um, pretty close to the best it can, uh, uh, sort of minimal sum of products representation. But for some cases like parity, it turns out that um, the sum of products is always, has an exponential number of terms um, in the number of inputs. So, it, you know, in this case, if you have four inputs, it's going to be in the order of, I think, 16 terms. If it's five, it's going to be in the order, in the order of 32 terms or so, something like that, which is obviously very big and doesn't scale. And that's kind of an artifact of the two-level representation. Um, however, aside from that, uh, we also saw that for some things like or, so let me maybe remind you, uh, if you take something very basic like uh, like uh, like uh, or let's hope the code didn't break. Um, if you take something very simple like or, then um, you get a bigger circuit than you would expect because in fact you can just write x or y, but it ends up having it, it basically ends up writing uh, ends up writing a term for every true row of the truth table, which is three terms. And so that's uh, not a redundant, it's not a minimal representation of sum of products. And I mentioned that for some of these simpler cases, and this is why I want to make sort of a, I guess, a correction or an annotation. I think I said that you can easily fix um, some of these redundancies. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted to emphasize that I'm talking about the easier cases like or. Um, to do the general case is actually NP complete. Um, there are heuristics like Carnot maps, Quine McCluskey algorithm, and I guess Espresso is the thing. I mean, if you're interested in this stuff, th these are all the classical sort of, uh, all the classical uh, textbooks, top textbook topics. 
Um, these are all um, th these are all basically heuristics that can th that don't guarantee a minimization. Um, and the Quine Matlesky is basically the computer version. The, the Carnot map stuff is sort of what people are taught to do by hand in I don't know like exams and stuff. So it's not um, terribly. Um, oh, so oh, sorry. This is not heuristic. This is just this is exponential time as well. But anyway, the 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 point is uh, for, for these small formulas with only a few inputs, you can definitely solve it optimally. Um, but once you get a lot of inputs, like for example, suppose you wanted to apply this to an entire circuit with like a hundred inputs or something, the um, something like Quine Matlesky or something even more naive, like just brute force enumerating all possible sum of products representation and picking the smallest one that matches the truth table of the thing you're trying to find. Stuff like that is exponential time and the number of inputs. So it's, it's very slow. And then there's things like Espresso, which um, I think, you know, it, it doesn't have exponential running time, but it's also not guaranteed to produce a minimum representation. And in fact, by, I guess, by computational complexity theory, it can't always yield a, uh, a minimal representation while running in uh, polynomial time and stuff like that. So anyway, I didn't want to push that stuff too much to the side. However, um, it, it's pretty rare nowadays that you care about you care deeply about optimizing some of products representations. I mean, I, I think if you look at modern logic optimization and logic synthesis tools, they definitely have that in their tool belt. But my, but my sense is that it's not a workhorse. And for whatever reason, it, it's been historically very heavily emphasized in textbooks. So I did want to mention it and connect it to that comment I made last time, but it's not, um, you know, and there is some interesting theory to it, but it, it's, it's, my sense is that it's overemphasized compared to what people actually use in real logic synthesis and optimization tools. Anyway, um, one other change I made, which I should comment on, uh, is that I changed from using just a bunch of uh, individual uh, separate input bits to having a single input, which is a bit vector. Um, and w without going too much into detail about what that means, it should be pretty self-explanatory. It's just a way of working with multiple bits as a vector rather than having to uh, deal with each of them independently. And so a lot of the clutter here went down um, from that. We'll be using that heavily going forward. Um, and same thing here. Um, oh yeah, and so the other thing we covered last time is, you know, as an alternative to the uh, sum of products representation, I covered the, uh, the mux, the, I mean, I guess you, uh, the official name is something like a binary decision tree or a binary decision diagram. But uh, the way I explained it and the way I intended to have it end up, it was just a tree of muxes. So a mux is like a conditional uh, selector node that can select between one of two possible uh, operands depending on a control bit that corresponds to like you know the conditional expression of, of an if expression or something like that. Um, and so using the Shannon expansion, I showed how you know, given any function, you can sort of progressively discriminate on leading bits until you're all the way down to a constant. Um, and so uh, as an example, if you try to uh, to build that circuit um, using this function of Mux's function on the parity function, so this is taking the, the XOR of the of all the argument bits, um, you get you get this. And so um, this thing actually, this was sort of a happy discovery that this, uh, I hadn't been planning on covering this yet, but it sort of just happened accidentally, I guess, unanticipated um, when I was demoing it last time. It actually ends up discovering shareable nodes. So you can see these nodes are used by two other nodes each. Um, if you if you exploded all of these out so that there was no sharing, then it would actually be exponential size as well, but this is only linear size. You have two nodes for every level of the tree, except for the top level. Um, and uh, I should mention in the notation here, now that we're using bit vectors, rather than having a bunch of separate inputs, you have a single input and then you have these index nodes. And so you should read this just like you would read I sub three in, in code. That's basically what it means. It selects the index four uh, bit. So it starts counting at zero, it's zero based. Um, and that's it. Uh, and 
I mean, I, I won't cover this now, but it, it, it turns out binary decision diagrams are very useful for all kinds of stuff. Uh, in this case, this is probably not how you would typically want to represent it, because it, even though it's linear size rather than exponential size, it's uh, linear depth as well. So you can see there's a long dependency chain going all the way down here. So if you had, I don't know, if you had 32 bits, this would be basically 32 deep. Uh, whereas if you use something more like a, a binary tree um, and tried to sort of do divide and conquer, you would have, for 32, you would have a depth five tree. So um, I think one of the first things I want to show today is uh, is that uh, basically covering, th this is a special case, you can use this function to mux this stuff for any function, but in particular, when you're trying to do these reductions, I want to show you how you can, um, rather than doing things in kind of linear depth, and the the intuition is that in a circuit, I should, I'll say more about this later, but in a circuit to a first order approximation, you can think of it being kind of like, you know, it, it has parallel execution, right? So um, the depth essentially represents the critical path for parallel execution of a data flow, di or of a data dependency diagram like this. So uh, if it's linear depth, it means it's, it's like linear time if you execute it in parallel the way it effectively is, it happens in the real world. Um, if it's logarithmic, it's logarithmic depth and so on. So you want to minimize the depth. And one of the nice things about using GraphWiz to visualize these diagrams is that it tends to lay stuff out in a way where you can clearly see the layers that correspond to the depth. Um, so you don't just get a mess where you have to disentangle which things are going, which are, you know, which edges are going up and which are going down the hierarchy. Uh, it really wants to lay things out so that edges flow forward and uh, placing the nodes and layers and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, the first thing we'll do today is how to um, is how to build a balanced reduction tree, uh, and we won't be using uh, muxes for that, but um, th that's just the, the most recent thing we did. So so let's try to do that first. Um, First, let's do the, like I said, the linear depth thing, but let's not do it with muxes, which is a weird roundabout way of doing it. And although, um, except for this, let, let me just make this side note. Um, if you look at efficient ways of implementing XOR at the transistor level, like very low level, one of the most efficient ways to do it does in fact use muxes. Like um, the main thing you would do uh, is get rid of this thing here. Like you wouldn't, the idea of, of muxing between constants is a bad idea. So it turns out if you look at what this actually means, um, this thing here means, look, if I4, then 1, else 0. So this is this node here is just equivalent to I4. And this is the flip. So, th so this node here is equivalent to, to I4. And this, equivalent is equi uh, this thing here is equivalent to not I4. So aside from that, the rest of this is actually reasonable. Um, so let me just mention this algebraic identity in passing. XOR of, well, let me write it in my own notation. XOR of X and Y is equivalent to this. When X, then not Y, else Y, right? Because if X is one, then for the XOR to be one, Y must be zero. In other words, not Y must be one. Uh, and if X is zero, then Y must be one for the XOR to be one. So, um, this is um, this is an important identity for XOR. What this is essentially saying, by the way, is that an XOR is a conditional inverter. So here you can see it's conditionally inverting Y dependent on X. Um, and so anyway, um, and so if you make the simplification in this diagram where this thing here is replaced by I4 and this is replaced by not I4, you can see that this first level here is actually um, just XOR implemented as this identity. And so this entire diagram here, when you make those simplifications, uh, where this is these, the, 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 the top node and the bottom node at every step, I think they're alternating in the order, but basically one corresponds to just po the positive version of the node and the other one corresponds to the inverted version of the node. And then the, the when essentially selects between those two polarities conditional on the next incoming bit. So, um, that's essentially the interpretation of this diagram in, in, in that way. But let's just write it out directly, the same kind of thing directly in terms of, of XOR. So let's say we have five bits uh, and we have 
an output. And I'm just going to call reduce XOR directly. And you, you can, in fact, do that. Um, uh, remember, the reduce, reduce XOR is just a thing we wrote ourselves. We're just, we're just writing, um, we're just using the XOR operator, essentially putting it between every element um, of this list. Um, let me write this out manually, actually, rather than using the built-in reduce function. So you can see exactly what's going on if, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so yeah, this is the same kind of thing we had with the mux tree, but now using directly a, uh, an XOR operator. So you can see what it does. It first combines the first, uh, well, and I'm going to say first, meaning the zero, zero, index zero element. First and second element are combined. Then those, and that is in turn combined with the third, then the fourth and the fifth, and then we're done. So this has linear depth um, for five things. There are four operators to pass through before we're done. Um, and um, just to make it clear, let me write, this is probably not going to behave exactly like the built-in reduce, but it's going to be sufficient for our needs. So suppose you have a um, you have a function and you have x's. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a running like a running sum. That is, so this is going to be the thing we return eventually, um, and then we're going to accumulate into that. So this is an accumulator. Um, we're going to accumulate into that as we go. Um, and let's see, we want to skip the first element. Um, but ideally, we want this to work with an iterable thing. So um, what's the easiest way? I guess I can use like I slice. Um, just to make it more general. So this just slices off the first element. Uh, and then for every successive element, we want to do this. Uh, we want to combine the existing accumulator with the new incoming value. Um, the operand order here, I mean, as long as you're consistent in theory, it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, right, yeah, we can't do that. So, um, Actually, let's, there's an easy way to do it. We first turn axis into an iterator. Oh, we don't have to use this junk. We first turn axis into an iterator, um, and then we take uh, the first element using this. And we're going to assume that this thing at least has one element. And so next is going to actually throw an exception. Um, but um, And then this is going to peel off the rest of them. I think that should work. Um, so let's see if this does the same thing as before. You can see it does. Um, if uh, if you reverse these, well, so it it flips the whole diagram in order to make it cleaner, but otherwise it would just flip the edges. Um, but so that's essentially what it's doing. It's a, sort of an accumulator loop. That's why it's linear depth. There's no parallelism inherent in this. Um, now let's. Um, Let me uh, just call this linear reduce, and for now I'll define reduce to be linear reduce. Um, let me define um, logarithmic reduce. Um, and the way this is going to work is, and, and for this we really do need something that's like sliceable and subscriptable and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, basically, um, there are uh, a couple of cases. If you're down to a, uh, a sequence of, and this could be either a bit vector or a list of things. Um, if you're down to something of length one, then you just return the, the, the only, the, the first and only element. Otherwise you, um, you recursively reduce the first half. So I'm going to define an index I, which is going to be the splitting index where we cut things down. Uh, and then we do the same thing to the upper half. So here I'm just using slice notation. And we're going to define i to be the length of x is divided by 2. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Python 3, you have to use this double uh, double slash if you want truncating integer division, otherwise you get floating point division. Just a change from Python 2 to 3. Um, so anyway, um, let's try to plug this in to reduce. Okay, object of type generator has no Um, that's fine. One thing you can do if you want to have a more generous interface that directly accepts iterators is to do the following. Uh, you make a list of things up front, and now I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to define a helper function. Um, and then we don't have to, um, we don't have to also pass uh, the function around. That's just implicit. It's clo closed over. Um, and actually, we can just do this. We can do it there. So then, what we do is before we do this, we turn it into a list. And you know, and, and if you're not so used to Python, a list is an array, so we can subscript that. Um, and then we do this. In this case here, we can work directly with the iterator uh, or the iterable thing because we are accessing accessing it linearly. But here, we really need to do this divide and conquer thing, which requires slicing. Um, Let's see. So we're passing in a generator, and then we now have a list of things. And we're down to two things. Um, Oh, sorry. This is wrong. I shouldn't. It shouldn't be. I shouldn't be returning a list of, of that element. I should just be returning the element itself. Okay. So let's see. Um, with this thing, what we have now. So um, this is a little bit unbalanced, but maybe a good example to show that this does work for non-power of two. It just means that sometimes the split is not perfectly balanced. Uh, but um, for example, if you made it eight, which is a power of two. Um, you can now see you have a balanced reduction tree. All, first, all the e even elements are combined, and then in the next layer, the you know the the upper and lower half are combined. And finally, everything's combined, right? So uh, that's how simple it is to to do that. Um, and so that's kind of a general uh, pattern: is that you know logarithmic depth things tends to be the best you can do. In fact, it's provably the best you can do if your fan out is constant, um, given n things to reduce them down to a single thing, regardless of the specific process of combination. If you can, uh, if you only have um, constant fan out, and it doesn't matter if it's fan out two, fan out four, or some any constant fan out, the um, the minimum depth of the reduction circuit, regardless of the process specifically of what going what's going on, has to be logarithmic because you can basically show that, uh, you know, for example, if the maximum fan out is four, you can at most quadruple the size of the of the circuit at every point. And so, if you start at the the result node and you kind of quadruple at every stage, you can at most fan out to ultimately to four to the n um, uh, terminals. Uh, basically, that's the idea. Behind that proof, and so depending on how much fan out you allow, the, the circuit is going to be shallower for higher fan out, or can be sh shallower for higher fan out, but it's still going to be logarithmic. It's just the base of the logarithm changes from, for example, two to four, or something like that. But anyway, um, and you know, again, if if uh, so, let's see how deep is this. Uh, one, two, three for eight. Uh, if you, which not coincidentally is because Eight is two to the three. If you now go back to uh, to something like this, you can see it's now seven deep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And um, if you wanted to have, for example, suppose you have a sorry, if, suppose you have a thirty-two bit thing or something even bigger, then it becomes even more significant. Then uh, having thirty-one 
XORs in a chain is actually extremely slow. That's if this was something you wanted to do in a single clock cycle of like a high speed CPU, for example, uh, that would be completely out of the question. Um, but you would probably be able to do a five deep XOR. Yeah, a five a, a five deep XOR chain would probably be possible in one cycle with like a one gigahertz uh, processor or something like that. Um, but anyway. So that is uh, one very simple but very useful idea, just divide and conquer. Um, and of course, this also, you know, to tie it back into kind of parallel programming for, for software, this is the same thing in software. If you have a big problem um, and you have a ton of processors and you want to distribute the work, you typically want to do something along these lines. Um, sometimes you, you can do it in a single level. Like if you have a big array of like one gigabyte of data and you have a hundred processors, um, you can chop it, you can divide everything into a hundred different pieces equally sized and then do some kind of reduction at the end where you combine the pieces. Um, so, so this is kind of a fork join type of pattern. Uh, I guess you can look at it that way if you want. All right. Um, um, I want to move next into, um, well, there's a bunch of standard circuits uh, or sort of circuit elements that, uh, that that are important or good to know about, um, and we can cover a couple of them. Um, up, uh, and and but today I also want to uh, work on some simulation stuff. Actually, writing a simulator. Um, so f going forward, we're kind of going to mix traditional logic design topics with actually implementing some, you know, some programming language stuff, some simulation or analysis stuff as well. Um, but uh, maybe um, let me, uh, let's see, maybe decoders. Um, let, yeah, let, let's talk about, actually, let's use the reduction circuit. I'm trying to think of good applications of reduction circuits. Uh, you can do parity, obviously, which is this thing we defined here. Um, um, but um, there's some other good applications. So let me show you one of them. Um, suppose you want to uh, suppose you want to compare um, suppose you want to compare two two inputs, and these are now not individual bits, but they are bit vectors. So you could think of these as being, you know. And I mean, I don't want to make them too big because then the diagram is just going to get messy. Um, but, you know, these would probably be like 32 bits or 64 bits. Uh, if you imagine that these were like registers on the CPU. Um, suppose you want to compare them. So you want a single bit that says, are these equal or are they not equal? Okay. Um, so how do you do that? Um, and that turns out to be a very simple reduction problem. Uh, that uses XOR and then a reduction. So here's what you do. Um, you XOR them bitwise, right? So th there's two parts to this. There's first something that's bitwise, that's perfectly parallel. There's no kind of crosstalk between the different elements of the bit vector. Um, this is a perfectly parallel thing, uh, constant depth. And all this does is for every bit, um, you compute the XOR. And, and so, um, Basically, what this exploits is the fact that um, bit one equals bit two uh, is equivalent to not XOR bit one bit two. In, in case you've never, or actually, let me write it like this. This is the cleaner way to do it. If you want to check whether two bits are unequal, it's the equivalent to checking whether their XOR is one. Um, I, I think that should be clear if you think about it for a second, but maybe you haven't realized that before. Um, but anyway, this is um, this is a a thing, and um, if you want to check whether two vectors are equal, essentially what this boils down to is you have to check if all the bits are equal, right? That's the definition. If two bit two bit vectors are equal if all their bits are equal. So we first have to we we first compute a vector from the XOR. Where each uh, element uh, is zero, one, depending on whether or not those bits are equal, and then you do a reduction to combine all of them. Um, 
So uh, step one is um, you simply uh, you XOR them, and then you have to uh, well, and we can maybe talk about different ways of writing it. But one way to do it is to directly implement the bitwise equality by negating the XOR. Um, and so that's going to be one. And then you want the output to be one if and only if all the bits are one. And so that's an AND reduction. <clears throat> so let's see what this looks like. So uh, bitwise operations um, are just kind of implicitly vectorized in the sense that when there's XOR, it doesn't show what happens to each of the individual bits. Implicitly, it does the same thing to every bit. Um, and so we XOR it, we negate it. And so at that point, um, all the positions that are equal in the bit vector are going to be 1. Um, so that is 0, 0, and 1, 1, which normally, if you XOR them, gives 0. But then if you negate that, you get 1. Um, and then that's, you know, we fan out this bit vector corresponding to uh, to this. So, so at this point, everything is bitwise. But then we have to do this logarithmic reduction using AND. And um, that's how you compare bit vector. Uh, that's how you compare two bit vectors. So um, this is a very common operation, obviously. In the arithmetic unit of a CPU, you do this kind of thing, for example. I mean, all kinds of things. If you want to have... Um, if you want to have um, counters with a dynamic limit, this would be used. All kinds of things use this. So again, very important that you use this kind of balance reduction tree rather than a linear depth reduction tree, especially when the number of bits uh, grows. Here it's not so important, but still uh, three levels is better than seven, right? By quite <laughs> by, by literally over uh, by two x. So um, that's one example. Um, What's the other one? I just thought of one when I was looking at this. Um, let me also see if people are commenting on stuff. <laughs> um. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I was completely ignoring the comments to stay in the zone. Uh, yeah, Fabian was commenting, <laughs> good thing CPUs don't have silly shit like that. Say a parity flag that is set to match the parity of the last 64-bit result you computed, which is, you know, x64. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's six levels deep, even if, well, it's not necessarily six levels. I guess you can do greater fan-in. You can do maybe three or four fan-in XOR gates, but, uh, but yeah. Anyway. Um, all right, so this this, this was uh, this was a simple comparator. Let me mention one thing that's really common, which is a special case of this. So if you look at this thing here, um, this is when you're comparing two dynamic values, meaning uh, both of them are unknown, and you want to check whether they're equal. Um, a very common case is that you're comparing against a constant, um, and so, um, for example, you want to check whether something is equal to 5. Uh, if you want to check whether something is equal to 5, then uh, so you, you just have a single input and you want to say, so, so you know, I don't know, 5 is maybe not the best. Yeah, I mean, we can take, pick any random value. Um, so I want to write this, but I also will then show you that um, This is probably doesn't. Ex this is not clever enough at this point. Like my, uh, this is something that any uh, any logic optimizer would pick up on, um, but I don't currently do that when I construct these different nodes. Um, so you can okay, it didn't seem to regenerate it. Oh, six. You can see this here doesn't really, the way the diagram at least uh, states it, it doesn't really do anything different because it's just the same thing but with a constant jammed into one of the operands. But the point is that um, 
XOR acts as a conditional, I mentioned this before, XOR is just a conditional, um, XOR is just a conditional inverter. So this is one way of looking at it. And when X is constant, then the this thing here, you, 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 can, you can roll out each bit to being either Y or not Y, right, statically. Uh, and so, and this is what, you know, like a real logic optimizer would do. But right now we don't do that, um, but I totally could. Um, but, um, well, and actually, let me do a special case uh, comparison checker, meaning special, special case, meaning I'm going to write something bespoke. And this is something that you shouldn't have to write, but let me illustrate it. Um, equals constant. Um, Let's see. Okay, yeah. So let's make this equals constant thing, um, which essentially amounts to this, but is more efficient. And so what I'm going to do is um, let's see. Um, I mean, I guess you could do it in different ways. Let's do it this way. Um, we basically want to compute the the vector that corresponds to this. XOR thing. Um, and uh, uh, and what you'll do is you'll say XI if X and uh, Else, not x, y for i in range, len x reduce and something like that. Um, and so what this is doing is it's basically iterating over each each position in the bit vector as i iterates over the different indices there, and for each of them it's checking. So k is assumed to be a constant. It's checking whether the constant has the ith bit set, um, and if it does then the resulting vector has the positive version of the x bit, otherwise it has the negative version. Uh, and then we do the and reduction same as before. So this is just kind of uh, the same thing, but um, but written, you know, again, it, it wouldn't be very hard uh, to, to implement these sort of optimizations on our side, but uh, for now, let's just do it manually. It's probably more, a better illustration anyway. So you can see what, I mean, so five is four plus one. So what we want is we want um, the lowest bit, we want bit zero and bit uh, bit two to be one and everything else to be zero. So bit zero and bit two, you can see these come in positive, but everything else goes through an inverter. And then we have the same reduction network as before. So uh, this is a very standard thing when you have these hard-coded limits and you're doing comparisons and stuff like that for counters maybe. There's there's other ways to do counters that don't involve comparators necessarily, like clever ways where you build linear feedback shift registers that have just the right period maybe or something like that um, if, if possible. But um, but this is kind of what you want uh, in general, and this is basically just what we were doing before, but taking advantage of the fact that we know the constant, we know one of the operands. Um, Let's see here. All right. Um, let's see. People had comments. All right. So that's uh, that was how to compare things. Uh, two two dynamic operands. Here's how to compare things efficiently when um, when one operand is is known as a constant and the other one is is dynamic. You don't know what it is. Um, let's do a simple adder and then I'll move to the stuff that's more sort of programming language, like doing a simulation, how to write a simulation for this stuff. Uh, so I'll do, uh, I'll do a ripple carry adder as the last thing sort of today. So, um, going back to, okay. So, so say you want to add two bit vectors. Now you want to interpret the bit vectors as representing a you know, a non-negative, a natural number in, um, in base two. 
So I assume if you're a programmer, you know about how to add stuff in different bases. Uh, base two uh, is um, is of course especially simple because there's you know there's not too many very, very different possibilities for for the digits to worry about or for the bits rather. Um, and so uh, the simplest, I mean, essentially, the, in some sense, the way everything works is really just like the great scoot alg algorithm, and then you add on tricks. Um, so if you want to add, uh, I don't know, like if you, if if you if these represent numbers in base two, and you want to add them, recall that the process is you start at the least significant bit, uh, and in general, you have an incoming carry. You have a carry from uh, the bit before. Um, when you start with the very lowest bit, sometimes, depending on the context, there is an extra in carry, um, uh, and sometimes there isn't. But in general, if you consider a general bit, you have an incoming carry, and then you have the two operand bits. And so you're basically adding three bits, and you want to produce uh, the bit in that position and the carry, the outgoing carry bit. And so if you think about it, the, the biggest possible number you can get is 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. Uh, which corresponds to uh, one one in binary. I'm going to, or I'm going to use this underscore to signify the base. Um, and um, and so the good news is that in this situation, and this is true for any base, you can only have a carry a outgoing carry of one. You know, you can never kind of overflow multiple bits when you do the carrying steps. Um, so so summing summing the three bits, I mean. And so in this case, you would have, uh, there's there's no incoming carry, and here there's nothing at all. Um, here there, um, there's an incoming carry, uh, and then you're adding the carry there, so it's that. And then uh, you have uh, three, and so it's one, and there's, you know, it's something like that. Um, and so the basic the basic iteration you want to represent is uh, has this shape. You have uh, you have x and y, which are the um, which are the uh, operand bits that that are uh, you know in each column, and then you have an incoming carry, um, and uh, and and you want to feed these into uh, I'll call it add three. And uh, and you want to get back two things. You want to get back which what, what I will call S, which is the bit in the same column as the things being added, and then also uh, a carry out, which is the thing that gets carried to the next column. So um, this is kind of the basic iterative structure of this kind of addition. And then uh, if you if you implement this exactly. You get what's called ripple carry addition because you handle each column at a time, and you can't do the next column until the previous column has completed, and so everything is linearly chained. It's like a serial algorithm in terms of how it chains together different bits. Um, but but this is the right place to start. And so if if, if if this is the structure, then the only real question is how do you implement this add three function, which is normally called a full adder. A half adder is when you don't have an incoming carry, uh, and you might um well uh you you can build you yeah anyway let, let's talk about how add three is implemented um the there's different ways you can do it um the easiest way to do it is to i mean if you want to be completely brain dead about it you can just build a truth table using your knowledge of how the arithmetic is supposed to work and then seeing how things shake out um an easier way to do it is to note that XOR is equivalent to addition modulo 2. So uh, XOR of two bits is equivalent to the sum modulo 2. Um, and so it's exactly the right thing, and you can check that for yourself. This is a very important property. This is one of the reasons that XOR is so universal is that it actually has algebra. It's, it's in some sense more algebraic, in, at least in the conventional sense of algebraic. It's more algebraic than something like OR. Uh, and you know, in particular, uh, you can subtract. Like you know, whereas uh, this thing is saturating. So if you add zero and one, uh, you can't subtract out uh, the one again. Or you you know, you, there's no way to subtract because of the saturation. But anyway, XOR is x plus y mod two. So the XOR gives the 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 least significant bit, and then you just have to compute the carry after that. Um, and so uh, 
there's different ways you can write the formula. And rather than writing it with carry in, I'm just going to write X, Y, and C because it turns out that actually all the things you're adding are in some sense symmetric. Um, yeah, actually, let's write it separately. Um, there's different ways to write this. Uh, like I said, one thing you can do is you can just XOR like this. Um, and then to compute the carry, I'm going to show a few different ways of writing this. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot because some of the reasons you write them differently depends on what you're doing with them in fancier ways than we're doing today. But I'll show a few different ways to write this. Um, but, but XOR for this one is pretty much just how you do it. Um, for the carry, uh, basically you want to have a carry if the sum of these things is greater than or equal to two. Um, and so you can, one easy symmetric way of writing it is to do a case analysis is to say, well, how many ways can we write, how many ways can we get two or more? And so we, we say, well, we can have X or Y, or we can have X or C, or we can have uh, Y and C. So here we're really just doing a case analysis over all the combinations of set bits that can give a sum of at least two. And so um, that's, uh, that's one way of writing a full adder. Um, and so given that this is what we have, um, now suppose you want to, uh, you want to just add two vectors. So here they're interpreted as being, actually they can be bit vectors if you're doing carry save addition, um, but, but not, let's not talk about that now. But in general, you'll think of X, Y, and C as being individual bits rather than bit vectors. But if you think of what this formula does for bit vectors, it actually works too. Um, but if you do this one here, um, now we want to do, we assume we have bit vectors. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to build up a list of the output bits iteratively. Um, and so I'm going to um, I'm going to make a list of things. So it's going to start off empty. And we're going to initially have a carry of uh, an incoming carry of zero because we assume, I mean, and we could have we could have it come in from here if we wanted to, and maybe maybe we will actually. So then X and Y are bit vectors, but C is a single bit. Um, and then, I mean, you don't have to wait, write it this way, but you could write um, maybe like this. Um, maybe I'll write it like this then. Um, S, I, C is the add three of X, I, Y, I, and C. So you add those corresponding uh, bits. So the incoming carry in the first iteration, it comes from the outside and successive uh, iterations. It's the one from the previous step. Uh, and then we, we append this bit to our vector. Uh, and then we have to make this into a bit vector at the end. We use this bits function to do that. Um, and so um, let's start with just a four bit vector so we don't get overwhelmed by the details. Um, and so we are going to add, oh, and we're, actually let's just call them X and Y. Let's call this S. Um, this will be CO. Um, So we also output the carry. Do something like this. Okay, that's already too much. Um, actually, let's do this differently. This is also a good example of how you can use um, uh, submodules to kind of clean up the diagrams. So, um, well, first let's just, uh, b before we do that, this is what you should do probably, but before you do that, let's bring it down to two bits, which is really, once you've seen two bits, you've seen them all because it's a, 
re repeating structure. Um, let's see here. So you XOR, uh, you XOR the first bit of X and the first bit of Y, and then XOR the incoming carry, and that's the lowest bit of the output, bit zero. So this is a this node here is a bit constructor. It, it concatenates a bunch of different bits into a bit vector. Um, but then you can see we also compute a bunch of, of other stuff here. Um, and uh, for the higher bit, we um, we XOR the uh, the X and Y bits, and then we XOR that with the carry, which comes out here. So yeah, that looks reasonable. Um, let's clean it up so you can see the the, the structure better uh, by by hiding you know the nonsense about the exactly how that full addition, the three way you know three to two addition is done um, for the bits. By putting that into a module, so we're going to make a module and just call it add three. And um, I'm basically going to uh, to just repeat the structure we had in the function. I'm actually going to keep the function. This is something you'll see me do repeatedly because often I want to have a functional interface, even if the underlying uh, implementation is based on a module that hides the details. And so I will do something like this, and then I will say uh, s is uh, the output bit. Maybe we'll just call this CI and CO. Um, and I'll, I'll show better versions of these formulas in a sec. There's all kinds of obvious things. Like, for example, you can factor out one of the products, or you can combine two of the products. And, and there's all kinds of stuff you can do. But let's just do this really naive version first. So uh, now we have this as a separate module. Uh, and then here, uh, you can basically. Um, you can instantiate it, um, and um, just hook up the corresponding. Um, I guess CI should be C, and then we want to return adder dot S and adder dot CO. Should be CI. This should be CI as well. And now you can see it's much cleaned up. Uh, these add three modules encapsulate what we were previously kind of inlining. Uh, and now you can see this kind of chain structure of how you, two of the inputs are always just directly from the uh, input operands, but then the carries are chained through. And now if you turn up, uh, turn up the bit width, um, you should be able to, this is maybe not the cleanest way of laying it out, but you can still see that if you start at the least significant bit, there's a dependency chain that chains through this, 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 uh, all the way to the output. So this is called a ripple carry adder or carry ripple adder because the carries ripple from the lowest, you know, from the lowest bit all the way up to the highest bit. Um, and it turns out you can do much better than that, but we're not going to cover that side of it today. Um, although that's a, a classic topic and one that's worth knowing about. Um, I should also mention in FPGAs, it's regardless of what you're doing, you'll almost never do this kind of thing manually yourself if you're doing logic design. You'll use like you'll use building blocks, like or your your logic synthesis tools are going to know what kind of adder to instantiate, uh, and maybe if you're a very expert, you'll do it manually. But um, I'm covering this just because it's such a basic topic, and if you want to understand how stuff works, I think at the very least you need to understand this, uh, and it's not very complicated. So yeah, um, all right. Um, I think that was in about an hour for the sort of pure logic design stuff. I'm going to spend probably the next hour working on simulation, implementing the simulator, and then we can actually simulate all this stuff and we can write some tests to exercise it. Um, someone's asking if this works with negatives. Um, yeah, it does in two's complement, that's right. 
yeah, that's w w one of the great things about Two's complement is that a lot of things don't actually have to change. Uh, you can just do it as a, you don't have to know whether things are adding or positive or, or, or uh, signed or unsigned. Only a few things have to change. Like comparison has to change. Do I want to show how comparison works? Maybe I will do that. But that I guess it kind of requires me to talk a little bit about two's complement, which um all right, maybe I'll say something about it. I think we can cover that pretty quickly. Um, so, kind of don't know how much I can assume people really understand two's complement. Like everyone knows it a little bit, but um, all right, let's do it. Um, let, so, so. Uh, Given that we have addition, we can now do subtraction. Um, and actually, let me get rid of this because this is just going to annoy me. Uh, I'm not going to either take an input carry or output and carry on the outside. Um, this is it's useful to have that kind of carry chaining if either if you're using this thing as a building block to build bigger adders. Um, but it's sometimes annoying to have to. So I'm just going to suppress the incoming carry and the outgoing carry here. Um, so let me just verify that and then I'll show subtraction and all this stuff okay so now you have the internal carries um, so one thing I should mention here is that when one of the operands is known to be a constant, either, well, typically actually it has to be zero, typically, uh, for, for it to qualify as a half adder, then really what you're doing here is when you're adding zero, you're not adding anything. And so um, if you want to be nice, you should handle the lowest bit. If, if this is the structure you want, you should handle the lowest bit a little bit differently, or at least your logic, optimiza it, your logic optimization tools can easily handle this. They know that XORing with zero is a no-op. They know that anding with zero always gives zero, and they know that oring with the resulting zero from that is in turn has no effect, right? So, uh, if you if if you uh, if you make simplifications that result from setting ci to zero, uh, what you get is th this term here is killed, this term here is killed, and so all you end up with is this. And so this is a very kind of beautiful thing called a, a half adder, like this structure with the xor and the and is um, is a half adder. You can actually, uh, one thing you can do is you can build a, an add three from chaining two add twos, um, which you can probably see. So actually, let me mention one simplification you could do here and then. Uh, um, Um, so basically, the, the, the way I wrote out this formula, let me just pull it out. Um, if you look at this formula here, you can basically factor out common terms, and you can pick any of them uh, in theory because everything is symmetric. Um, so, for example, if you t if you take this thing here, um, this is equivalent. If you're writing this in algebraic notation with times and plus rather than and and or. This would be equivalent to uh, what, uh, x times, let's just write c times this. And so you can write um, x plus c, or x plus y times c to factor it out. Um, and so one thing you can do to rewrite this is you can write, I mean, you could write this. Um, but actually, it turns out you can write this as well. You can use in in, in God, let me pull this up. This is bad way to explain. Uh, let me pull it to a separate file. 
So, so this is equivalent, just in complete generality, is equivalent to uh, to this just by factorization. Um, but then, in further in combination, given that uh, if you then look at this, so that means if you combine those two things. Um, you get this, but it turns out that in combination with the and, um, this is actually equivalent to this. So normally, of course, you can't replace an or by an XOR, but it turns out that the case where or and XOR differ is when they're both one. But when these are both one, then yeah, this differs, but then this thing here is true. So this thing kind of overrides the fact that, so even though this is not term-wise, these two terms are not the same, when when ORed with X and Y, they're, they're equal because in the case where they are both one, they differ, but then this thing takes over and generates an output carry. Um, and so th this is uh, equivalent. And uh, in fact, let me uh, write a specific form where these are used. So you write these bits and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go into detail about what they mean. Um, but this is a useful way of splitting things out for reasons you'll see in another video. But um, suppose we split out these intermediate results, uh, x and y and x, uh, x, x, or y, x and y, called p and g. This stands for, uh, this is the wrong way around. Um, no, this is the right way around. Sorry generate if both of them are set um, and um, and then what then you can rewrite this as being P because that's just one of the subterms and this here can be written as this thing can be written as G and then the thing I just wrote before with XOR this becomes essentially uh, this so in instead you get You get this. Well, and of course, as long as you're looking at it that way, you're not going to see a difference. Let's look inside uh, that full adder just to see the structure. So you compute these PNG bits, and then that comes in. Um, anyway, so that, that's a, a way of, of writing it that's quite common. And it reuses the um, the result here from from this computation. So it's less area. However, uh, if you want to minimize delay, it's, it could be better. It, and it's usually done. In fact, you do use the OR version here um, because even though it means you can't reuse the output from the XOR, turns out that OR has less delay than XOR uh, typically, uh, unless you use some crazy dynamic logic. Um, all right. And uh, the other thing I want to note, uh, these are the half adder. These are the half adder outputs, you remember, when we were looking at half adder being when the when the carry in is zero, these are the only things that matter, right? This, you can see that directly here. Because when CI is zero, then you get P. Uh, when, when CI is zero, then this term is never true, and so you can just have G. So uh, these just correspond to the half adder results. Anyway, all right, enough about Ripple carry adders for now. Um, let me bring that, bring the example back up. Um, um, Boom, 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 boom. Oh no, I said I wanted to do subtraction. Sorry, so, so, so let me finish stuff related to addition and subtraction and comparison and stuff like that. So uh, subtraction turns out to be very simple in two's complement. Um, X, uh, X minus Y or rather minus Y negation is the equivalent to bitwise negation uh, plus one. 
Um, so just flipping the bits and then adding one. And so for example, classical case is minus one. If you take, say it's a four bit thing, if I flip each of the bits, I get this, and then I add the one and it fills in the lowest bit. So if you take uh, minus one and two's complement, you get the all ones uh, bit pattern, which is very important bit pattern, uh, very symmetric. Uh, has shows up in all kinds of places as being a very special value minus one. All right, um, and so because of this, you can do x plus y as simply x plus uh, x plus uh, y negated plus one. And so, um, and this actually makes me want to put the carry back in <laughs> um, because. Now you see one of the reasons that even if from the outside world's point of view, you don't care about having carry, uh, like input carries to your adder. Like for example, risk five doesn't have um, carry carry flags. It doesn't have status, you know, status register like a bunch of older ISAs do. Um, however, internally there is a, an input carry to the ALU because when you're doing subtraction, you want to be able to conditionally set the input carry to one you don't want to have like two different versions of the adder and you have to add an extra one at the end or whatever. And you especially don't want to do like a plus one as a completely separate addition on top of what you would normally do. So um, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, that you do this. And so for example, uh, if you wanted to do this, you simply do and let me say that it's zero by default. So we can always use that interface with two operands if we want. Um, in order to do this, you simply do this. So the same structure can be used. And so let me show that. Didn't I put in a default? Oh, that was in there. Okay, so you can see the only difference is um, Y's operand, operand bits are all negated, and you have an, a carry of one coming in. So now let me show you a simple ALU where um, you have. Um, you have a single unit that with the same adder can do either addition or subtraction depending on a bit, which is like an operation bit, which is just an extension of what we just saw. Um, and so, what do you, so we're going to have the same stuff as before. Um, and then I'm going to have, I'm just going to call this sub. I guess we can't call it sub. I'll call it neg for negate. Um, and I'm not going to directly call this. I'm going to sort of do it directly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the following. I'm going to call add. Um, and the second operand is going to be either, depending on if it's negative, then it's going to be not y. Otherwise, it's going to be y. And incidentally, if you wanted to, you could write that as xor. Um, and so let's do that. Um, and then, um, and then this thing here, if it's negative, should be um, let's call this n just to keep everything single variable. Um, and then the the carry should be you know zero if you're adding, or one if you're subtracting. Oops. Oh. Um, let me write it like this. You can write it as XOR, but right now my XOR doesn't broadcast. Um, so it's probably cleaner to write it with this, but you can do it with XOR. Um, just fine.
Wait, why would it complain about that? Missing two positional arguments. Oh, that's not what I want to write. Okay. This doesn't do anything. Oh, because I didn't mark it as an output. So, what you can see here is you have x and y, and then you have a bit. And depending on whether this is 1 or 0, uh, you either get, if it's 0, you get addition. If it's 1, you get subtraction. And it's the same structure. The only additional delay is that you have to conditionally flip one of the operands. Um, and incidentally, that's almost free, especially in a ripple carry structure, because the, the critical path is the carry propagation. Um, and so you have basically almost infinite time to do the XORs for the higher bits. The lowest bit is on the critical path, but everything after that is not. I guess so the so I guess my point is you have an extra I guess you have an extra XOR on the critical path, but you don't have like, you know, N XORs on the critical path because all of those are completed by the time the carry makes it up the way to their position. So um this is one of the magic features of two's complement. It's not just that you can do it with the adder, it's that um, you can reuse essentially all of the circuit structure by just uh, flipping a few extra bits or feeding a conditional carry in. So um, this is a very the beginning of a very simple ALU. Um, and maybe I will take it a little bit further. Maybe I'll just do logic stuff today uh, and then we will do simulation next time. Um, oh, so um, can you talk about the intuition for why flipping the bits and adding one is equivalent to subtraction? I can see it's true, but don't understand why. Uh, I think the easiest way to look at it, you can look at it in different ways. There's sort of a higher brow pr perspective that has to do with um, uh, piatic arithmetic and uh, you know modular arithmetic and stuff like that. But if you want to look at it bitwise, I think the the way I like to, I, I think actually looking at examples is the easiest way to do it. If you take any vector of bits, so to so take some arbitrary vector of bits, if you negate it bitwise, let me just make sure I do it right. You will note that in every position, so this is the original and this is X. You will note that in every position, um, they are always complementary bitwise, right? Like that's, uh, once complement, I mean, this is basically like the bitwise complement in every position, they're, they're different, which means that when you add them, they always add to one because there's always one is one and the other is zero. And there's never any carry because they're never both one. And so when you add them, you always get a vector of all ones. And if you agree to call this minus one, then what this says is that X plus its bitwise complement is always minus one. Um, and if and, and you can justify why a minus one is called minus one by adding one and noting that adding one uh, kills zero because if you add one to this thing, it essentially, uh, you know, as you propagate up the, the carries, they flip the bit on the way out. And so eventually you run out of bits and you get just, you know, all zeros. But I think the, the basic pattern to understand is this one here, which is that when you add X to its, its bit Y negation, every, it always adds two in all ones. And then you just have to justify why that is minus one. And then, so, you know, basically this thing here is immediate. And then you just have to establish that that's actually minus one. Uh, I think that's the easiest way to see it sort of in a bitwise fashion. Um, then there's sort of a fancier mathematical picture, which maybe I'll talk about later. Um, but I think this is the, the basic bitwise intuition that's important to have. Um, all right. Um, let's talk about comparison. Um, the basic intuition about comparison is that um, if you want to see, so we, we did, we did, sorry, we did, we did equality comparison. Equality comparison doesn't care about whether you're comparing bit vectors or numbers and one, you know, one's magnitude, like, or whatever. Uh, actually with something like 
with some representations that have multiple representatives of a single value, like for example, sine magnitude plus and minus one are bitwise distinct values. And so you have to be a little bit careful, but assuming everything has exactly one bit representation, uh, it doesn't care about what it's comparing. It's just a bunch of bits to it. Um, when you're doing uh, inequality comparison, so X is, you're asking if X is less than Y, then things matter. Um, there's different ways you can write this. Um, I'm tempted to show you a way to write it that is unconventional to say the least, but is maybe, you know, basically one thing you can do is you can look at it lexicographically. Um, so you can say, I'm sure you probably know this. Suppose you have two vectors um, like this, and you want to compare them lexicographically. So in this case, suppose that the X position represents the most significant component. Um, then what you do is you say either um, X1 is less than Y1, or X1 is equal to they're equal and y1 is less than y2. Um, so this is like a graphic comparison. And one way of thinking about what this means for unsigned uh, values, at least, is to say that it's a lexicographic comparison starting with the most significant bit. Um, and this thing here in bitwise terms is really, you know, you're like, you can work out what this means. Like you, you, you can work out um, like what's the truth table? Um, the truth table is, uh, so it's only this one value that yields uh, yields that. And then for this thing here, you have, um, you know, you, you, you can do this sort of thing. So you can directly implement lexicographic comparison on a bitwise basis, and you have to start with the most significant bits. Um, if you do that, you will actually get something that is perfectly reasonable. And actually, I, I've never actually implemented it, but um, I don't see why this wouldn't just, I mean, it, it will it will work. Um, I don't know how it compares to using an adder. Um, one of the advantages of using, well, um, I should also mention you can easily use divide and conquer for lexicographic comparisons. So, for example, if you have 32 components, you don't have to chain them like this. You can compare the first half, you can compare the, the two upper halves, and only if one upper half is less than the upper half do you have to really look at the lower half and stuff like that. So you can use a binary reduction tree for this stuff. Um, and if you do that, I think you can probably get similar speeds to parallel prefix adder base. Anyway, some fancy stuff we haven't covered yet. But anyway, so this is one way to do it is that you literally just implement this lexicographic comparison um, in the textbook fashion. But um, the way it's typically done in an ALU is that you already have this adder, which is actually also a subtractor conditionally, right? Um, and so instead of doing this, you can do this. So uh, instead of implementing the lexicographic comparison, you can do the following. You can subtract and see if it's less than zero. Now, less than zero in this context is choose complement, and it means that the sign bit is set. But you have to look at the right sign bit. It's not, if you start with, if X and Y are initially unsigned operands, so you're going to interpret these as unsigned numbers. Um, so initially, it seems like this is not a choose complement problem because we don't have signed integers. But in order to do this part of the problem where we subtract them and we compare to see whether they're less than zero, we do have to bring in signed integers. So even if they're not in this version of the problem, once we transform to here, we have to bring in signed integers. And the idea is quite simple. We are going to zero extend by one bit in order to embed the unsigned integers into the n. So if they have n bits, we're going to add an extra bit yielding n plus one bits. And then we're going to subtract those as two's complement, which is you know just using the same adder structure we've seen, essentially looking at the uh, the output carry for that. Um, and if that output carry is set corresponding to the sign bit of the zero extended integers, then um, 
then x is less than y. So um, let's do that. Um, and we're not outputting the carry right now. Now we need to output the carry because the carry is actually going to control um, whether, you know, whether it's, what do you call it? Um, wh whether the comparison is one thing or the other. Um, uh, let me let me make another front end. This is a little bit sloppy, but. Um, Just to keep the existing code working. Just make sure it doesn't break that. Um, so, um, kind of building up our mini ALU step by step. I'm not going to overwrite the existing code. I'm just going to kind of expand it. Um, so if you want to do a comparator, we are going to, um, we're going to use the ADC function. We're going to, uh, we're going to do the subtraction and then we're going to get the carry bit. Um, and that's going to be the output. So um, this is how, um, unless I messed up, I think that's the idea. Because so basically, um, I, I guess I can show with some worked examples. Rather than looking at it in terms of the carry, the way I always think about it is that what you're really doing is you're zero extending, which corresponds to treating the numbers unsigned in the wider space of signed integers with one, you know, one additional bit. Then you're doing the subtraction there where there's a notion of signedness, and then you look at the signed bit there. Um, and that just happens to be equivalent to looking at the carry out. The reason I like that perspective better is that it works also when you're doing signed comparison. Because, um, so, actually, let me write this out another way that doesn't explicitly use the output carry. Um, if instead of using the output carry, I do explicit zero extension, it would be equivalent to doing this. Um, I need to introduce this notation first, though. Um, this at sign is bit concatenation, and so when I do at zero, it's equivalent to concatenating a zero to the end of the bit vector. So if this is uh, if this x is four bits wide, when I concatenate a zero, it's five bit wide. Same thing here. So if you add these two, this is equivalent to, and if I then take the last bit of this, so this is just using Python index notation. If I take the last bit of this this is equivalent to the carry of the unextended vector. One nice thing about this picture, aside from not having to think about carries as being separate from other output some bits, um, is that if you want to do sign comparison, um, um, I wasn't planning on covering this today, so I haven't really thought through how I wanted to explain it. But if you want to do a sign comparison, all you have to do is change this to be um, zero extension. So you add an extra bit, to the um, to the adder, and um, you do this. Now, in effect, you don't actually need to have an extra bit in the adder. You can just work out what the math uh, ends up being. Oh, sorry, this would be sub, not add. Uh, and if you end, if you work out what the math ends up being, in this case, it's the c out. Uh, if you look at the full adder equation for that highest bit. It's uh, this ended with not. Uh, let me type this. It's this ended with not that ended with C out. Um, and then Fabian will correct me if I'm wrong. But if you basically, if you do this subtraction of the sign extended things and look at the highest bit, it's equivalent to this full adder equation 
um, uh, where you use the the C out and then you do this. Fabian, do you agree that this is the correct uh, equation if you wanted to, uh, you know, first using the sine extended sine extended subtraction and looking at the sine bit of that, and then if you want to sort of un unfold that so you don't have to, have to actually do an extra bit in the adder, you can unfold it to this. Does that does that look right, Fabian? Uh, I don't want to give people totally wrong ideas. Uh, I think that's right. Um, and so. Oh, <laughs> anyway, I, th I, th I think this is right because it, it's too simple. It's pretty simple. Really what I'm doing here is I'm using the normal, uh, I'm using the normal uh, full adder equations when you have you know three things, you're XORing them together, that's what you care about. So you care about the XOR of the three operands and the three operands are the incoming carry, which is the outcoming carry from the lower block and then the uh the the operand bits which one of them is the just direct sign extension the other one is negated because we're doing subtraction um so i think that's right so anyway um so this here is an unsigned comparator and if you wanted to treat it as a signed comparator you would do um, something like this. And if we had simulation, we could trivially verify this, but um, that's what I was planning to write today. But I think this is right. Uh, you can write it in a different form. Like Fabian says, it's conventional to write it in terms of two intermediate bits called N and V, which often correspond to processor status flags, which are used to synthesize, their combinations are used to synthesize different kind of uh, flags to drive different kinds of branching. Um, but I think it, for, for me, this is the most mathematically natural, and I think you can probably reduce this. Uh, anyway, like for example, anytime you're, like you can, for example, this ending, ending one of the operands here, if you wanted to, you could pull it out here um, because it's equivalent to multiplying by minus one. So you can just pull that out like you would a multiplication by minus one. No, I guess that's not true. Is that? If you flip one of the operands, you flip the output of the whole XOR. Yeah, I think that is right. Um, so anyway, I think this form here is the most natural. It corresponds directly to uh, let me just write this to this stuff here. All right, um, but yeah, I hadn't. Sorry, sorry if this stuff was confused. I think the unsigned comparison, the the nice way of looking at this, in my opinion, even though I don't see it explained this way normally, is that in both cases there is a an extension, but in one case you're zero extending by one bit because you're thinking of it as an unsigned operand, in the other case you're sign extending by one bit because you're thinking of it as a signed operand, and the key is when you. Oh yeah, I should mention this. The key is you cannot overflow when you extend by one bit. Um, for example, with four bits, uh, if you have four bits uh, unsigned, the largest possible number is 15, the smallest possible number is, is five. Um, if you do uh, zero minus 15, that's minus 15. And if you compare this to five bits uh, unsigned, um, Um, the max is um, the, the min is minus fifth god minus 16 the, the max is plus 15 right um, and so you can see in both of these cases when you extend by one bit um, signed then for the unsigned case both the, the minimum and maximum difference fits within the representable integers of this when you add one extra bit. And so when you subtract it, there's no overflow, which is normally what you have to worry about. But when you do this, you, you cannot overflow. And so the sign bit is, you don't have to worry about overflow when looking at the sign bit. 
Um, and the same is true if uh, you go from five bits signed, um, in which case I guess it would be seven and minus eight. And the minimum difference would then be minus eight minus seven, which is minus 15. And the max difference would be seven minus minus eight, which is uh, 15. Um, uh, the same in both cases, of course, they're just negations. But the point is, in both of these cases, the minimum and maximum differences are representable when you add one bit and you stay signed. And so that way, when you subtract these things in, in that broader context, in that broader space of, of representable integers, you cannot get overflow, which is why the sign bit is doesn't suffer from overflow issues. That's how I think about it. Sorry, I hadn't prepared that. Uh, that's a little bit complicated to explain if you haven't seen it before. All right. Um, Okay, maybe that's a good stopping point. The simulation stuff, there's no time for because that's at least one hour and we've already gone an hour and a half. Um, I guess next week then we'll, we'll work on some simulation stuff. So today we covered, what did we cover? Um, how to do logarithmic depth reduction trees, how to do comparisons between bit vectors, how to do that more efficiently when one of them is a known constant. Um, how to add numbers in binary using uh, ripple carry adders and showing a few variations of full adder, how to write the equations. Um, then how to do subtraction and choose complement by just uh, tweaking the inputs to a, uh, an adder um, and, and showing here how we can share all the structure between those two cases using the control bit to select between the operations. Um, how to do unsigned comparison by zero extension by one bit. How to do sign comparison by sign extending by one bit. Um, and I think that's it for today. So uh, we'll continue this stuff. Um, ne next session we'll have some, I guess, some kind of language stuff, like some implementation stuff, writing a simulator for, for what, we, what we have so far, rather than just looking at diagrams and doing kind of math on paper. So that should be interesting. But uh, that's it for today. Everyone have a good weekend, unless people have questions. I don't think they do. I haven't seen any questions. All right. Yeah, everyone have a good weekend. I'll be back next week with more of this stuff.